Can we lift up our voices unto God? Can we stand up on our feet and give praises to God Almighty? I need to hear some hands clapping. I need to hear a shout of hallelujah. I need to hear a shout of praise. Well, actually, I don't need to hear it. God needs to hear it. Let's try it again. Can we cry out hallelujah? Can we cry out praise the Lord? We thank God for being here on today, and we welcome you to the All Nations House of Prayer Bible Study. We'll call it Bible Study on today, but we thank God for each of you being here, and to our streaming audience, we praise God for you on today, and we know that even though you're not here in the building, you can still join us in the worship, you can still join us in the praise, and God can meet you right where you are. We want to lift our heads down and lift our hands up and give prayer unto God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you, O oh God, in humility. O oh God, we come before you humble in prayer, O oh God, because you have been so good to us, God. You've been so great to us, God. You've been so merciful, so kind, O oh God. And we don't deserve it, God. There's nothing we could do, God, to get your love and your kindness. There's nothing we could have done, God, but you saw fit, God, to call us, oh, God. You found fit, oh, God, to choose us, oh, God. We thank you, God, and we praise you, God. We adore you, oh, God, and we acknowledge you as the King of kings. We acknowledge you as the Lord of lords. We praise your son, Jesus. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, oh God, that's dwelling on the inside. And we ask you, oh God, to be with us on this evening in this service. Make our ears attentive to what we're going to hear on today. Let us increase in knowledge and wisdom. And we ask you these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you, oh God. We're going to be reading from 1 John chapter 2, and we're going to start at verse 12 and go down to the uh, 17th verse. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning, I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that does the will of God abideth forever. How many of you want to abide in the Lord forever? And that is my prayer on today, that we do the will of God, that we may remain in God. We praise God and we thank God for his word. We're going to do something a little different today. I know many of you um, have seen the notices online uh, we're going to talk about a topic that I think is important. We're going to talk about some uh, digital danger awareness and training. And I don't know anyone personally that does not use digital technology. I don't know anyone that doesn't. And there are so many scams and cyberbullying happening. Just this week, you all, someone opened up a fake Facebook ac account and, and had my identity all over it. So it happens. And I know some others have happened too, and you may have experienced some other type of threat. 
So we're excited that we're going to address that on today. And uh, our sister, Kendra Barnett, who is the director of Penny Real Children's Advocacy Center, is going to um, make some introductions. So before she comes up, um, if you can, grab out your phones, take your phones out, go on Facebook or YouTube, whichever one you, you use, and share this service so that everyone else out there can hear this very important information. And if you're watching online on Facebook or YouTube, please share this important information so that others can hear it live. And without further ado, we'll call up Sister Kendra Barnett, who will move us further. Let's clap our hands for her. Praise the Lord, everybody. You can take your seat. I'm so glad to be here tonight and be able to talk about an agency that I love so much, the work that I love to do, and to provide some awareness and understanding about a topic um, that I was recently, I've been aware, but I recently was in a training in Florida and I felt so impressed and compelled to share this information um, with my family here. And um, we have so many children, so many young people. And sometimes as a, as a culture and as a church, we can be very naive to um, the uh, attacks in the world, things that's going on in the world. And so I really felt compared to share this. Went to leadership and um, was afforded this opportunity with a very quick turnaround <laughs> to get this training put together. So I appreciate you, Pastor Carol, and leadership for the opportunity to share. If you don't know, my name is Kendra, and I am the executive director of the Penny Rowell Children's Advocacy Center. I love this agency very much. I've been in child welfare for about 17 years. Um, I started my professional career as a frontline social service worker where I did investigations of child abuse. And for a very short period of time, I went to the Office of Inspector General, and I have been at the center for the last 12 years, and I love it. I love it. I think the work that we do is, is very important, and I love to share and talk about it. So I'll give you a very brief, if you haven't heard my spiel about the center. Since this training tonight is sponsored by the center, I, I got to share that, right? So um, prior to the 70s, I wasn't here, but many of the people in the room was here. Prior to the 70s, there wasn't a lot of um, legislation that told us how to respond to child sexual abuse. Right, so um, with very limited resources, very limited training, if a child disclosed that they had been sexually abused prior to the 70s, for instance, they told their teacher that they had been abused, right? And so with very limited resources, very limited training, that teacher took that child to the nurse and said, you know, certainly we need to share this information with the nurse. And so the child and the teacher, they go, they talk to the nurse. When they get to the nurse, the child tells the story. And then the nurse says that certainly it's important that the guidance counselor know about this information. So the child and the teacher, the nurse, and the guidance counselor, the, the child tells the story again. And then the guidance counselor says it's really important that our administration know about this, right? We need to get the principal involved. And so the child and the teacher, the nurse, the guidance counselor take the child to the principal. They tell the story to the principal. Um, after we talk to the principal, the princ principal understands that we've got to get law enforcement involved, right? And so they call law enforcement, and the same thing happens, and the child has to tell the story of law enforcement. Law enforcement takes the lead on the criminal investigation, but they don't take the lead on the child protection investigation. And so now child services has to come, and the child has to tell the story again. And what we learned is that every time this child is telling the story, they're reliving that trauma. So there was an attorney in Huntsville, Alabama that decided we've got to change the way that we're responding to this, right? We are losing cases, there's holes in our prosecution because this child is reliving this trauma. And thus was the birth of child advocacy centers across the nation. It was a response to a broken system. And so we are one of 15 centers across the state of Kentucky. There are hundreds across the world. I've trained with people even from South Africa. And it has just been a privilege to be a part of this work. One of the first things we do now that we have legislation that dictates how we respond to child sexual abuse um, is when law enforcement social services gets that report, they contact our office. Our office facilitates that investigation. We're going to do a one-stop shop. So we have a child-friendly environment where law enforcement can bring their child. We're going to interview them. I'm a trained forensic interviewer. Claire, who you'll meet soon, is a trained forensic interviewer. We're going to interview that child on site. We're going to do that in a way um, that is cognitively and developmentally appropriate and can also be used in the prosecution, can be used through the court process. Um, after that forensic interview where everyone is present, law enforcement, social services, mental health, everyone is present because our goal is to reduce the number of times that that child has to tell that story. 
right? So we also have advocates on site that is going to support that family. Say it was the father or the mother that was the abuser and they were the breadwinner and now this family is without resources. Our advocates are going to be present to support that family through that process. We also offer mental health. Um, we're operating out of two facilities as of late. Um, we have one in uh, Christian County, one in Hopkins County. We're offering mental health services out of both of those. Um, we have a trained professional, medical professional, Sister uh, Latanya Dooley is actually working with us and providing specialized child sexual abuse exams um, for our victims. We use a very specialized process where we can examine a child for um, bruising, scarring, tearing to their genital area. Uh, we can collect evidence for rape kits. Um, we can provide that information and uh, do that service right at our center. That is what we do. I love what we do. I love to talk about what we do. And um, I am excited to be before you to talk about an addition to our services, which is uh, awareness and prevention. So I'm going to invite Clara up, and we're going to get started. We're slated to go about 50, 50 minutes tonight, and we're going we're gonna to try to stick to that as best we can. Okay, you want to start the slideshow? Okay, um, I'll let Claire introduce herself and then we'll get started with our show. Good evening, everyone. My name is Clara Butler and I work at the Penny Rail Children's Advocacy Center as a forensic interviewer and a program coordinator. I have been there going on eight years. It brought, I was brought to the Child Advocacy Center through my internship when I completed my bachelor's degree for social work. And I've been there, November will be eight years. Um, I do have something that I don't want to do really quickly. Clara has been with me. She's grown with me. She's been a great support. Um, she has, I can, I can honestly truly say, we believe in giving credit and honor where honors due. I can truly say that I would not be the leader or the director that I am today without her, without her support and without her pushing me. Um, every time I have an idea, because I'm very visionary in that way, Every time I have an idea, she's always there to support me. She's always there to push me. And so I really believe in giving flowers while you're alive. She's not expecting this. And so I just wanted to give those to her. I love this girl a lot. She's on this journey with me. I have a goal to, be, um, to present on an international platform in the next three years. And I, when I got that vision and that idea, I came back and told her that she was doing it with me. And it has nothing to do with her goals. It has everything to do with my goals. <laughs> So, okay, um, as a disclaimer, our topic tonight may seem explicit. You may hear and see some things that seem, um, some information that um, you think may should be censored, um, but we're going to talk real tonight. We're going to talk about the realities of the world. This training is sponsored by the Penny Rowell Children's Advocacy Center. Both of our salaries, in part, are um, provided by the Children's Advocacy Centers of Kentucky, the United Way of the Penny Rowell, the Cabinet for Health and Family Services, and the Vic and Crime Victims Trust Fund. Next slide. Our objectives for today are to recognize potential digital dangers, to recognize the internet's impact on mental health and child safety, and recognize online safety techniques and to normalize them. Next slide. As a general question, what do you perceive to be more dangerous, the real world or online world? Just shout it out, anybody. Online right now? Online right now? Okay. I want to share a short trailer to set the stage for our conversation tonight, and the trailer is called Childhood 2.0. A long time ago, families were in communities. They were local. They were small. I was born in the very depth of the Great Depression. I was put to work carrying wood, carrying water. I knew how to shell peas. I knew how to break beans. We still didn't have electricity. <laughs> I have two Instagram accounts. I use uh, Instagram, Snapchat. Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok. TikTok and Fortnite. I can just scroll for hours on end. 11 hours a day. It's been eight, nine. Maybe like 12. It's actually been a way that we can keep track of them out there in the real world where things really are scary. The lives of kids were sort of changing slowly for a while. And then all of a sudden, most kids were able to get on social media and that's when everything skyrocketed. The rates at which they're experiencing problems continues to increase. We also know that the teen suicide rate increased 56%. Last year alone, we received over 18 million reports of international and domestic online child sexual abuse. 
We have traded a false sense of safety and security for actually putting our kids in riskier situations. I call it the race to the bottom of the brainstem. So it starts with techniques like pull to refresh. Pretty much every guy has like an addiction to it, but oh, yeah. no one talks about but it. But it's just faster now, and it's younger. Well, yeah, like nudes of girls go around to school all the time. At the beginning of the year, there were multiple suicides before school even started. There were men that wanted to talk to children at all hours of the day and night. Don't be shy. On Snapchat, one thought it'd be a funny idea to talk the other one into committing suicide. And she did it. She's dead. After about six weeks, we were able to crack his phone. Kids right now are going to experience the worst of what we're going through. I won't nervous. <laughs> the first time. Do you think your parents know that this happened? No. 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 My kid won't do that. My kid would never. My kid's school isn't like that. You're wrong. Because what they see, they feel neurologically compelled to do. Right now, we're effectively living in an experiment. How is this gonna affect us? We'll find out. Pretty impactful about the world that our children are living in. So many of you were right, right? The online world is much more dangerous, um, but we can see that the real world still has that impact on us. So many of us are more concerned, even though we say and we nod that yes, the online world is more dangerous, many of our actions or lack thereof show that we are far more fearful of the real world, right? So how many of us allow our children, grandchildren, or children that we care for to go somewhere without knowing who they're going with, where they're going, or when they're coming back? Literally nobody, right? How many can say the same about their child's online experience? Right? What, we want to, what we want to suggest to you tonight is that it's just imp as important to know where they're going, who they're going with, and how long they're going to be there when they're online. It's just as important, if not more important. Um, see, the news media has really made us believe that what they show is most important, but we have provided our children the World Wide Web at their fingertips, and we spend days, we spend hours, we spend weeks, and we spend months without ever checking up on their online behavior. So we are in no way downplaying what happens in the real world because it can be scary and there are very real dangers in the world. But we do want to offer some perspective tonight. Um, information from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children um, show us this research. Non-family abduction, that's our stranger danger like I grew up with, right? The people in the black trench coats and the white van and don't talk to strangers, that's st stranger danger. Accounts for about 1% of missing children, um, according to NECMEC, which is National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Wandering or walking away, um, there's a specific emphasis on children with autism, um, accounts for about 2% of missing children. Important, but about 2%. Family abductions, right? That would be like our non-custodial parents or um, separated parents that take the child and don't return the child, accounts for about 4 or 5% of missing children. Sex trafficking, right? This accounts for about 18% of missing children. You see the jump there, right? The things that we often fear um, are not the things that we really should be fearing or not the things that have the greatest impact. Um, also, runaways I thought was important. Children um, in the age of run runaways was about 15 to 17, um, according to NECMEX research. Um, and a lot of the reasons why children are uh, running away has to do with substance abuse, mental health issues, physical abuse in the home, um, non-acceptance and that kind of thing. That's why it really is important that we empower our children, right? We know that our children are smart, they're beautiful, they are accepted um, and all those things because as they struggle with those issues that makes them at greater risk online. Um, so we have to empower and communicate with them. Um, there, are another, there are a number of things that parents can fear. We can never talk about all of them, right? Like SIDS, food poisoning, falling and breaking a hip, all those things are important. But what I want to submit to you tonight is that many of these crimes are exasperated by online dangers, right? Uh, many of the things that we fear, like someone taking our child or our child missing, they're exasperated by online dangers. Thus, online dangers, we believe, is the culprit. Next slide. Children use the internet in a variety of ways. For example, they're talking to their friends, family, texting them, and using video chats. 
They're also accessing popular social media sites like Snapchat, YouTube, and TikTok. And our children are also spending a lot of time playing video games. There are many types of consoles to consider when we're talking about video games. We're talking about Xboxes, Playstations, uh, Nintendo Switches. We're talking about the mobile device they have in their back pocket. And our children are also spending time doing research on the internet, right? They're doing research for not only for school, but for school projects, homework, things like that. But they're also looking up and researching anything and everything that is a possible interest or of theirs or that they're curious about. Next slide. So where are they accessing the internet? We know that they're accessing it at home and at school, okay? But how are they getting the access? Well, those kids, they have phones. They have computers, tablets, and iPads. But I would urge you not to forget about the gaming consoles or their little friends who take pity on them uh, to help them get that access. For example, friends will give their friends old phones from home, give them access to their hotspots. Simply taking away from their phone is not the solution. This graph that I have posted here for you, I want you to take a look at tonight because what we can see here is that children aged 8 to 18 who own their own smartphone. In the gray line at the bottom, you'll see that's 2015. The top line is 2021. There are three ages that I want to point out to you to take a look at. Take a look at our children aged 8. Right? It goes from 11% all the way to 30%, and we know that Ms. Kandra just told us that 8 is great. Right? We want to be talking to our children before then. But 31% of them already have cell phones. Look at age 12. It goes from 41% all the way up to 71%. Age 14, 59% to 91%. 91% of children have their own smartphone. A smartphone is a computer in their hand. Next slide. And so media use among children grew faster in the last two years than it did in any of the four years prior. Some speculate that this is due to the pandemic. Next slide. So let's talk about screen time. I found this graph very interesting. I'm a numbers person, I'm a visual person, so I like to share that type of information. And here we can see children aged 8 to 12 are broken out. Right, those are, those are preteens, right? And then we've got children age 13 to 18. And we can see that girls are spending anywhere from five to eight hours online, and our boys are spending anywhere from six to nine hours online a day. Next slide, please. Now, this, this slide shows our average daily usage by activity. <clears throat> There are good numbers up here. The two things that I do want to point out to you is video games. 60% of our boys are playing video games while 24% of our girls are playing video games. A big discrepancy or, or difference there. And then let's take a look at social media. 19% of boys but 30% of females. Mm -hmm. And so the next thing I want to show to you, I just wanted to point that out, the difference between the two of them, the male and female, so we can see where they're spending their time. Next slide, please. And so you may be wondering, like, what does all this really mean, all right? What we know is that online access, digital access, has an impact. And that's what we're here to share with you today. For ex increased exposure, what I'm referring to there is not only your child's exposure to the internet, to the world, it's right there at their fingertips, right? But it also gives the world untethered access to your child as well. Social comparisons, this is what we're, we're talking about girls here, because they're on social media, right? They're comparing themselves, their body image to other girls that they see, not taking in consideration that they've got pictures that have been altered, that are different, that are in filters and all kinds of things, but they're comparing their body as they see it in the mirror, which is actually reversed, right? It's not your true image, but they're comparing that to themselves. And then we got boys playing video games, right? And what video games are doing to our boys and the percentage of girls that are playing them as well, is that they're introducing violence and hatred, ha hatred and is also normalizing that behavior as well. During our research in Wakandra and I were talking, we actually also learned that there are video games that our children are playing like Call of Duty, Fortnite, um, Grand Theft Auto, and things like that. <clears throat> what we learned also was, is that Call of Duty was actually initially developed to train our men 
and women service people for combat and to desensitize them and prepare them. So the mental health implications, which I touched a little bit on, but the mental imp implications are anxiety, depression, suicidal ideations, suicide. Those are things that we need to be looking at and considering when we're talking about online access. Yeah, I just want to piggyback on the idea that that game was designed for military to prepare them for combat, right? So it's no wonder that we see young men going into schools, shooting other children, shooting teachers. It's no wonder that we see the violence in the streets. Um, it's no wonder that we see an increase in um, robbery and murder in the, in the streets, particularly around, um, um, as it relates to young boys. Um, because we know that the eyes are the window to our soul, right? And so what our children take in, what we take in, directly impacts our actions. Um, and so those games like that, I thought that was really, really powerful to know that the men and women fighting for our country are using this game to um, fight for our freedoms, and our children are using these games, they think, for fun, but in fact exposing their soul to, to deadly violence. Next slide. So I'm going to talk about online risk a little bit, and I'm going to talk about personal information. Like when we talk about personal information, most of our kids know what personal information is, our name, our address, and, and all those kinds of things. Um, that's, that's no secret at all. But let me ask you, when your child or when our children are online and they play Fortnite, Roblox, Grand Theft Auto with individuals through their gaming system, and they talk to them every day, right, and they know that this person is nine, or they think this person is nine, or they know this person's name, or they think they know this person's name, how many children would say that that's a stranger, right? What we are finding is that when they're spending time on these games with these individuals for an extended amount of time, they're referring to them as their friends. And so taking away that risk factor of them being a stranger. Um, when we are um, asking kids, you know, how does someone get your personal information? they'll say like, oh, a scammer or a hacker or something like that. And those things are very, very true. It happens, just like Sister Charity said. But more often than not, the number one way that people get our information is that we simply give it to them, right? Um, and so especially when we live in a small community like we do, it's not difficult to identify where someone lives based on the pictures. You can look at the trees, you can look at the houses and know kind of what neighborhood it might be in. You can look at the street and kind of know what area they're in. We simply give that personal information um, away. Um, also cyberbullying, Sister Charity mentioned that. Many of our children know what cyberbullying is and many of them would probably suggest that they've been a part of it, that they've witnessed it, right? Someone posts a picture, we don't think it's that cute, we post a comment, somebody doesn't like it, somebody screenshots, somebody shares it. There's lots of mean, hateful things that people say um, based on our posts. I think it's very important as we open the lines of communication with our children, which is the message that we want to send tonight, is opening the line of communication with them. As we open the line of communication with them about their behavior, it's just important to treat individuals online like you are supposed to treat them in person, right? There's another person on the, side of that, on the other side of that screen. Um, inappropriate content. Um, I think that um, many of our children know that some of the apps that we are on have age restrictions, right? I remember when Facebook, you had to have a college, you had to have a college uh, email address to get on Facebook. That's gone away. Now you're supposed to be, TJ, how old are you supposed to be to be on Facebook? What'd you say? 18? It's 13. It's 13. You're supposed to be 13, right? Kids don't care. They don't care. What they're gonna do is they're gonna go on there. There is, no, there is no way to validate, right? There's no way to check it. So what happens is our kids go on the app, they know that they have to be a certain age, and they know they gotta get above the age, right? And they don't care. They can scroll the numbers all the way back to 1959, and that makes you, I don't know, somewhere around 64 or something like that. And so as long as they can get in, I'm in now, and now I'm a 64-year-old man, right? Well, the problem with that is that many of these apps are algorithm-based, right? So now, men born in 1959 are probably seeing ads for AARP and Viagra. And so now we're exposing our eight-year-old kids that are hopping onto these social media, they're being exposed to those ads that are designed for men born in 1959, right? 
Um, so thus increasing their risk of inappropriate content. Mental health concerns, we talked about that. Um, the comparison on social media, you know, we've all seen it. I know I see it. When I see people traveling to Thailand, I wanna go. When I see somebody traveling to Bali, I wanna go, right? We see someone who's um, a size six, I wanna be that. You know, there's all this comparison that social media brings upon us. And what does that do to our psyche? What does that do to our self-esteem? Clara mentioned some of those already. And then talking to strangers. Um, Talking to strangers is huge. We talked about that a little bit, but um, kids are believing that those that like their posts, that share their posts, that they're their friends, right? And there is this sense of trust that you have with this friend. And we don't know anything about the person on the other side of that screen. And then I wanted to mention unsafe viral trends, right? Um, I'm gonna put Blake on blast here because a few years ago, my brother Blake did the cinnamon challenge, very unsafe challenge. And we all did it, and we're adults. Imagine what it's doing for the kids, right? I think Donya did it too, <laughs> the cinnamon challenge, right? But there's the water challenge. There is the Tide Pod challenge. Y'all remember when kids was eating Tide Pods, right? Um, there was one that I thought was super, super important um, because kids sometimes get fascinated with fire. There's a fire mirror challenge where kids are taking flammable um, liquids and making a shape on the mirror and then setting fire to it. And in 2021, I'm sure there's many more, but in 2021, there was at least one 13-year-old child that died by that challenge that she was exposed to online, right? Um, and then there's the choking and passing out challenge where kids are literally choking themselves to the point of temporary unconsciousness and blacking out. And this has been the cause of at least, it has been linked to the deaths of at least 20 minors. Ridiculous, right? But these are the things that our kids are seeing. And if it's on social media, it must be true. It must be fun. It must be right. Um, so we have to open the lines of communication and talk to our kids about these things. Next slide. So which apps are safe? Um, so the Apple Store has over 2 million um, apps. Android has over 3.5 million apps. There's no way that we can talk about or tell you which apps are safe and which apps are not. There's no way. What we're here to talk about is safe behavior. We want to encourage parents to use safe, to instruct their children, to teach their children, and exhibit to their children safe behavior. Um, we know that the enemy is very cunning, and we don't want to be ignorant enough to think that if we just expose one app, Snapchat, that, our, that alleviates the risk to our children. Uh, many apps are sharing some of the same features, and so we have to really put the emphasis on the behavior. And even if your child is good, and even if your child would never, there are other people on the other side of the screen that will love to take the opportunity to pray on your children, to pray on our children. So the key focus here is to talk about safe behavior. Next slide. Online grooming. So, in 2021, NECMEC's uh, cyber tip line received 29.3 million reports of suspected child sexual ex exploitation. And that was an increase of about 35% in just one year. In just one year. This, is, this thing is exasperating quickly. It is, it is growing fast. One in three minors consider, themselves, consider a connection that they made online a friend. One in four teens believe, they know it, it's not a secret. No one lied to them, they're not hiding it. They know they're talking to someone who is 30 or older. One in four teens. 40% 40 of minors have experienced cold solicitation for nude images online. And according to the FBI, 50% of victims of sexual exploitation are between the ages of 12 and 15. That's barely out of elementary school, that, that's middle school. Okay, next slide. So we're not here to talk about which apps are safe, but I do wanna note a few things about a couple of the apps, right? Here are some of the most popular ones, Snapchat. One of the features of Snapchat, if you don't know, that the kids love is that it goes away, right? Please explain to your children that it does not go away, right? Let's, let's share that message. Let's, let's trend that narrative that it does not go away. Claire and I are interviewing children every single day that think that it's gone away, think that it's disappeared. But we work with law enforcement that can many times access those pictures um, that have been taken that our, that our kids think have gone away. Um, Facebook and Instagram, um, those platforms are growing with new features every day. Um, YouTube, TikTok, TikTok, the thing I wanna say about TikTok is that many of the trends that we're seeing, um, we're seeing those on TikTok. 
Um, TikTok for me has become the new Google. You can look up almost anything on there, but for many kids, they're seeing trends, what looks fun. Someone is exposing on TikTok another app, and so kids are looking at TikTok, finding something fun, quote unquote fun to do, and then going to another app and exhibiting these dangerous behaviors. Um, Pinterest, and this one was particularly noteworthy to me, because Pinterest for me was all about like, what I wanted my house to look like, an inspiration board for all my weddings that I planned, all those things, and now Pinterest has just grown so much beyond that. I mean, there's reels on there, there's highlights on there, there's a snap, there is a chat feature on there. Um, I actually interviewed an elementary school child not long ago that was um, preyed upon and was asked for new pictures. She sent pictures of her body that hadn't even reached puberty yet. Um, she sent pictures of her, of her body on a chat feature on Pinterest. Um, and actually those pictures were used as blackmail against her. Um, once she decided this probably wasn't a good idea, that perpetrator continued to blackmail her with the first picture that she had sent, um, telling her that he would expose those pictures, that he would share those pictures, that he would tell her mom about those pictures. And this was on Pinterest, an inspiration board app, right? So again, we can't identify just an app in itself that's dangerous, but we have to practice safe behavior. Next slide. Oh, there was one more on there, and it's called Be Real. This one I wasn't familiar with, but this Be Real app has um, young people that are at a certain time, the app will let you know that you're supposed to take a picture of your face and then take a picture of your surrounding. It's supposed to be like, be real. What's your real life like? Um, and this is leading to a lot of comparison and challenges with our children, right? Because somebody posts a picture of their face, posts a picture of their bedroom because they got to go to bed by 9 o'clock, right? Somebody else posts a picture of their face and a picture like they're outside or like they're somewhere. And then kids are feeling this pressure to lie, to uh, change their identity, to be something that they're not, to appease the online audience. I didn't know about that one, um, but that one was interesting. I learned about that. Next slide. A couple others that I just want to mention really quickly. I'm not familiar with all of them because there are so many, um, but Twitch, LiveMe, Holla, Ubo is an app that's similar to a, like a dating app. On dating apps, I heard that you can swipe left if you don't want to talk to that person. You swipe right if you do want to talk to that person. And so it's just like that. People, uh, kids can find friends by swiping left, swiping right, strangers all over the world. Um, Discord is an app that uh, we have interviewed kids in our facility that have talked to us about Discord, which is a communications app that you don't have to have a cell phone plan or anything like that. You can do it on Wi-Fi. A lot of gamers are using this to communicate with each other. Um, and somehow, the kids that we're interviewing are going from playing games, Roblox, Fortnite, something like that, to sending nude images of themselves through this app. Um, but again, like I said, we want to be mindful that it's not just the app, because many of the apps have chat fe features. It's about the safe behavior. There's others, Hoop, Wiz, Twitch. You can look those up if you want to. I want to specifically draw your attention to an app that we heard is back on the rise, and it's called Omegle. Has anybody heard of Omegle? Chastity, TJ, who else is out there? Heard of Omega? Sharita, heard of Omega. This one is, we here are back on the rise. I didn't know anything about it. Um, in a training, we talked about it, and it was so important that I wanted to um, share this video about Omega with you. Things from suicide attempts, it gets pretty bad on here. It definitely should not be a site that should be up. <laughs> it's bad. It's bad. Uh, what's Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. The website Omegle has been linking up random strangers for video chats for years. But since the pandemic began, it's exploded in popularity worldwide, fueled by viral videos on mainstream social networks. On TikTok alone, there are now more than 9 billion views of videos about Omegle. It's a site that claims to be moderated, but has a reputation for being unpredictable and unsafe. I've been on it for 10 minutes, and I've probably seen like, 20 guys, you know. Men pleasuring themselves is a common occurrence. In one two hour period during our BBC investigation, we were paired at random with 12 masturbating men, eight naked males and seven porn adverts. 
The site has no age verification in place and we found dozens of under 18s, some children as young as 7 or 8. And it's not just adults doing explicit things. When we searched for chats using a generic sexual keyword, we were also paired twice with seemingly prepubescent boys masturbating. One of them identified himself as 14 years old. We ended both chats swiftly and reported the incidents to the relevant authorities. But the Internet Watch Foundation, a charity working to eliminate child sexual abuse imagery online, says it's concerned. It says the site's being used by predators to gather self-generated child abuse material. We do see content that's been generated uh, on the website on Meagle. The content that we see, um, quite shockingly, ranges um, right through to um, individuals um, self-penetrating um, um, on, on, on webcam and this type of activity is going on in a household um, often where we know that parents are present because there are conversations that you can hear you know even children being you know asked to come down for tea. One parent in the north of England told us that her eight-year-old daughter was nearly coerced into sexual activity on the site last month. My daughter had seen some videos go viral on TikTok about people being on Amigle so she explored the site these people were coming on and saying she was beautiful, hot, sexy. She told them that she was only eight years old and they were okay with that. She witnessed a man masturbating and another man wanted to play truth or dare. She thought it was just a, an innocent game, but he was asking her to shake a bum, take a top off and her trousers, which thankfully she didn't do. In recent months, police forces, schools and cyber authorities around the world have issued warnings against Omegle, but the website continues to surge in popularity. In the last year, traffic has ballooned from 34 million visits to an estimated 65 million visits a month. The site's grown particularly in the US, UK, India and Mexico. Lily and her friend, who was on FaceTime with her, are 16 years old. Yeah, she said one in ten conversations is actually normal, she reckons. Where did we hear about it? TikTok, yeah, through TikTok. Yeah, it was a few months ago our friends started using it and then we started just using it for, like, funny, like, well, there's weird men on that. <laughs> yeah, loads of them. TikTok says its safety teams are continuing to monitor Omegle content on their platform and have not found any offensive or illegal material. The company also said that as a result of our investigation, it's banned any direct web links to the website. We tried to speak to Omegle, but there's no way to contact the website. Leif K. Brooks, who's based in the US, created the site when he was 18 and is still the owner, so we tried to track him down. He has no active social network accounts and it took several attempts through a separate company he founded called Octane AI to get a response. He said in an email that Omegle is moderated and in fact he's increased moderation in the last year, removing users who appear to be under 13 years old. But many of the people we spoke to on the site say that it's not moderated enough. Uh, this is not a platform. The students or children should be here. There mm. should be some moderator out there keeping an eye on everyone. Mr Brooks also claims to have removed the ability to search for the generic sexual keyword we used. We weren't able to verify this and he didn't reply to any follow-up questions. I have met quite a few really nice people on here, but for a site that's so low managed and not really monitored, it, it really shouldn't be up. That's Omegle. An app whose tagline is literally talk to strangers. And this is on the rise in our communities and our children are being exposed to to apps like these. All right, so she's opened the door for us to talk about sexual, uh, sextortion, excuse me, child sextortion. And so what is that, right? Sextortion, simply put, is blackmail. It's blackmail. It is the threat of distributing sexual images of the child to force them to do something that they otherwise may not have done. Numbers that we want to share with you today from NetMEC do include that 66% of minors have shared self-generated sexually explicit materials with someone online whom they've never met. 45% of perpetrators follow through on their threats and distribute the images. The majority of our victims that we see will make one payment before they reach out to someone that they know 
and trust for help. 45% of cases involve more than one platform, which we just kind of heard on Omegle, right? You start out on Omegle, then you go to Snapchat, then you go to these other concealing and anonymous websites, and you just, they just keep moving the kid around. To illustrate these points that we are sharing, we do have one more video for you. It's titled, Sextortion, the Hidden Pandemic. All right, today's date is November the 12th, uh, 2013. The time now is approximately 7, 28 in the morning. Special R.D. Vice President is Detective Joe Phillips with uh, Virginia Beach Police. Do you remember that time period? Yes. Can you start to tell the jury what happened? I had, like, a friend request from this Steve Crofton guy. Prior to that date, had you ever had contact with a Steve Crofton? No. For the first time in history, we're letting strangers interact with our kids in the back of our car, in their bedrooms, in their homes. That online environment has just created this access to children that was never there before. Physiologically, they don't understand who is out there and what people are capable of. It's been called a new form of sexual assault, online sextortion. For each assignment, the increase that we've seen is definitely sextortion. Sextortion is probably the fastest growing crime in the world. That's right, sextortion attempts are skyrocketing. You know, we see cases come in for children as young as eight years old, nine years old. We're talking elementary school children. As a, a predator, you can actually create an online profile that matches the preferences of that child. He got information from our chats through my computer, information about my mom, about my sister. He had Google images of my home. From 16 years ago to today, there is no mole. Anybody from any walk of life could be involved in this. I mean, we've had doctors and police and clergy. Simply, the fact of who the offender was was very shocking in this case. We intercepted a letter that he wrote to the Chinese embassy in Washington. If they would break him out, he would give them all the information on the F-18. When you talk to me, please don't lie to me. You're a grown man, you're an officer of the Navy. These grown men are going after these young girls and they try to kill them. Might not be in their attention, but they're killing them. And we have to stop it. I, I would literally do anything to, to save one. And there's so many kids out there that need saving that there's just not enough of us to do it. All right, so what we know is that offenders of sextortion, they're persistent, they're manipulative. So I don't want anybody to get it wrong here today that just because a child self-generates a photo of themselves and sends it to someone that they are not a victim, they are. Offenders have been known to provide false identities, stalk children's social medias, and learn absolutely everything about them before they ever contact them. They then use that information to build rapport and talk to them about things and say, well, I can, I can see that and I understand that and I'm going through this too and things like that. And <clears throat> they build a rapport with them prior to even asking for sexual images. And then because they built that rapport, done a really good job and this child really, really trusts them and they may be in love, they may get into a relationship and they might get married and or et cetera, they provide the image to the person. Historically, offenders have had a primary motive that was believed to have been just to elicit additional sexual or explicit video or videos and photos from the child. But in 2021, 2022, I apologize. In 2022, it was actually reported that the, it, it was reported that 79 of the reports were actually financially motivated, meaning they were exploiting, exploiting a child all the way as young as eight we've seen that we've talked about here tonight for money. What eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 year old do you know that has money or access to those things? Next slide. Next I wanna to talk to you about concealing and anonymous apps. <clears throat> the first one up here is the calculator app. Has anybody heard of the calculator app and what it does? And Okay, so the calculator app, what it, it, can serve two, it can serve two purposes, right? The first one, it can help to, to conceal an app that a child or person does not want you to see that they have on their phone. So when you click it, you actually open that app. It can also serve as a vault, right? And so how it works as a vault is it appears, looks, and serves completely as a calculator, how it's supposed to work, 
unbeknownst to you, but there's a vault in that calculator. You simply need to know your, the person or the child's password. That password can look like a series of numbers, a math problem, a bunch of symbols, whatever they've set it to be. And then once you enter that password correctly, you get access to their vault. And it's up to them what they put in there. Uh, Ask FM and Whisper are two other apps that I wanted to mention tonight. What they are is they allow users to ask anonymous questions, interact with other people, answer people's question anonymously, so you have no idea who you're talking to. Absolutely just no idea. There are children on these websites and using these apps. Yik Yak, well, I wanted to talk about that one because I thought it had gone away and then it came back. It, so I looked it up because I was quite curious and it was established in 2013, then was taken down in 2017 due to sexual abuse allegations, exploitation, racially motivated violence, harassment, and cyberbullying. But since then, the app was relaunched in 2021. The same problems persisted, the developers did not address them, and since then, actually in May, Google dropped them from their store. It still remains on Apple's iOS store. Next slide. So I thought that this um, quote was pretty telling about our usage in social media. And it says that there are only two industries that call their customers users, and that's illegal drugs and software. That tells us a lot, and it's a big one to think about when we think about social media, because social media is, in fact, addicting. Next slide. What can we do? We've given you some heavy information, and I don't want you to think that your kids can't have a device, that our kids can't have a calculator, that they can't be on a computer, or anything like that. That's not the message that we came here to, that's not the message that we came here to share. Um, but more the message is that we can't become a culture that sends our children away to be raised by these devices, right? That we have to be intentional. I say all the time that parenting is not passive. It's very intentional. It's very engaging. And so when we send our kids off with iPads or phones for unlimited amount of times, we don't know where they're going. We don't know who they're with. And we haven't given them expectation of when they have to be off. We are raising their risk and putting them at greater risk. And if we are to believe that we have to train them up in the way that they should go, it's our responsibility. We say in our field that it's an adult's responsibility to protect a child. So what is it that we can do? Well, first I wanna talk about, next slide, what doesn't work. And that is scare tactics and threats, right? You better not do this, which I feel like is what most of us wanna do. You better not do this, you better not, you better not. It doesn't work, it doesn't, it, it doesn't work. Um, we have to open that line of communication and we have to talk to our kids about the risks that are out there. Um, I do believe that taking away a device is, a, is, is an effective form of punishment or consequence, um, but taking away for the mere fact of thinking that you are alleviating their risk of online behavior or going online is just a false narrative. Um, because like we mentioned earlier, they're gonna find a way to get it from their friends, they're gonna find it from school. Our schools have um, uh, given out devices and so that's just not a way to mitigate that problem. Um, there are other consequences that perhaps we can find. I wanna tell a story about my four-year-old nephew. He, um, he and my mom got into a, a, a tiff because he said that when you get in trouble, you do something bad, you get a consequence. And um, so we were talking about what's a good consequence, and my mom said, Zay, I think a good consequence is a good butt whooping. And Isaiah, who's four, he said, Mimi, that's not a good consequence. <laughs> he said a good consequence is taking away my tablet. So I do think that taking away a device can be a good consequence, but if you're taking away for the mere fact of thinking that you are protecting them from getting online or thinking that you're protecting them, it's just, it's, it, it merely is a, is a, a false narrative. Um, overstated statistics, um, stereotypes, dismissive perspectives where we just ignore it and just think that it's gonna go, gonna go away, um, that's a false narrative as, as well. Next slide. Okay, talking to our children about personal safety, doing it early, doing it open and doing it often. In our, in our world of child sexual abuse prevention, we talk about eight is great, the, the age eight is great. 
Um, because we encourage parents to start having that conversation about sexuality, sex, body safety, around the age of eight, right? We grow up this, with this notion that penis and vagina are bad words, that we can't talk about sex, we can't talk about those things, um, but we have to, right? Because what we know and what we have found out is that around the age of eight, the conversation of sex starts happening on the playground. And you want to be the person that sets the framework for your child's perspective on their sexuality, their perspective on safe sexual behavior, those kind of things. You don't want that coming from another eight-year-old on the playground, right? So eight is great. We want to start having that conversation about, eight, about the age of eight. As is um, the same with their online behavior. And earlier, if you have a six-year-old that you allow to play on a tablet, we need to have those open conversations. They need to feel open to come to you and talk to you. You need to know who, who, what apps they're on, who they're talking to, who they're interacting with on those on those apps. And then do it often. Our world is ever changing. The internet is ever changing. Apps are ever changing. We want to continuously have that conversation so that we can continuously reevaluate the expectation um, of our children and their behavior online. All right, so here today we have some strategies for safe practice for online. The strategies these strategies are not intended to tell you what to do or how to do it or how to be a mama or a daddy or papa or uncle, nothing like that, okay? It's just intended to help you and your family communicate and to make a decision that is absolutely the best for you, okay? These strategies are circular and they're not intended to be linear in any way, right? And we, we believe that each of these issues should be discussed and reviewed as a family regularly, as children in the digital world are always evolving. And so some examples of what I'm talking about as far as evolving, we're talking about as children grow up, you know, our, their screen time and their family expectation may change, All right? 13 looks different than 16 than it does to 17. Um, apps change, apps they use, who they see as influencers and who they follow most certainly will change, I promise you. Next slide. So this is a slide about setting rules and guidelines. Kendra and I do kind of cover this, and so we're going to go ahead and skip this slide here. All right, parental controls and platforms. Again, this is not all of them. This is not every one of them. There are plenty, and I, we encourage you to do your research, and if you don't use one of these, feel free to use the one that you feel like is right for your family. There are a ton of really, really great apps out there that can help. Most apps offer a variety of services and settings that you can use that's the, best, that's the best for your family. As you can see here, there are apps that are totally free. There are apps that cost money. I personally know about the Family Link app. That's the one that we use in our family. It is completely free. There's um, no premium upcharges or anything like that. At least that's been my experience. It enables me to know what my child is doing. I don't get like copies of their text messages with their uh, viewing online or anything like that. It does allow me to locate her. It does allow me to know what apps she's downloading, how much time she's spending on them, how much screen time she has. It allows me to set her bedtime and her screen time and things like that. And that was what, that's what worked for our family. But again, there are some other ones up there like Bark and like Bark and Kids Lock and Kaspersky. And so I do also want to talk a, just a second about Life360. Anybody have it? Use it? Okay. Life360 Life is an app that you can get for free. It is free and it does have premium options that you can upgrade on, but essentially what it does, it's a geolocator for whoever's signed on and part of that family group is, is how it works. Next slide. Um. My family uses Life360, but I don't have a child anymore. My daughter will be 21 this year. We got Life360 because she wanted to track us, and so we got it. When she became an adult, we had to get Life360 <laughs> so she can track us. Um, I want to talk, as we come to a close, um, about a contract. I know that this may seem trivial, not something that we are interested in doing. We're very accustomed to do what I said because I say do it. But I want to encourage... Um, it doesn't look like the, the wording is up here, but I want to encourage um, parents to open the lines of communication, have this conversation with your kids, right? And that may look like the terms of a contract, right? What better way to prepare them for the world? 
So when you talk about if you're going to get a phone, these are your expectations. That could include things like grade, cho grades, chores. Um, if I had a child and we were doing a contract, it would be like your smart mouth, like all those things. These are the things that you're going to do. These are the things that I'm going to do, and these are the outlined consequences, right? And that takes all the guesswork out of it. Um, we cannot, no matter the age, hold an individual accountable for what they don't know, right? And we can't set these expectations and these rules for them to follow if they don't really know what they are. And because social media is ever changing, because um, our, our digital usage is ever changing, it is very important that we open the lines of communication, we set those boundaries, set those expectations, and set those consequences, and then that we have the follow through. So um, we do have some copies of a contract. I'm not saying that you have to sit down and sign the contract, but it could be a good way to foster the conversation with your child, grandchild, or child that you care for. Next slide. The ultimate goal is awareness. This is what we pride ourselves on, is just bringing the awareness. Um, I hope that something was said that was um, informative to you. I hope that it did not bore you, but I hope that it's something that you can share, something that you can be aware of. No matter if you have a child in the home, if you have grandkids, if you love and care about kids, I think it's important to know, to open the lines of communication. You never know who a child might trust um, to share their experience, something that may have happened to them online. We've got to change this narrative about talking ab about not talking about things in our churches, in our homes, in our culture. We've got to change that narrative. Um, we, we just historically have not been really good at it. And in our work, we believe that it's an adult's responsibility to protect children. If we're going to train them up in the way that we should go, we've got to equip them. And that has everything to do with awareness, prayer, and communication. Thank you all so much for allowing us to speak tonight. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you, Sister Kendra. And thank you, Ms. Butler, for, for coming. Uh, we appreciate you all. That was excellent, excellent, excellent information. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. We pray the service was a blessing to you. If you would like to learn more about All Nations House of Prayer, or if you would like to give to our ministry, please visit our website at anhop.org. We also invite you to join us during our Monday night prayer call, our Wednesday night Bible study, and every Sunday for our morning worship service. Until next time, may God bless you and may God keep you is our prayer.